I can start while you are copying. <laughs> I think. Uh, oh, er, actually, all three. <laughs> um, Thomas Koch from uh, YMC. We're um, normally doing content management, uh, but a l little spin off from us does media monitoring now. And this is my project. And. Yeah, okay, that's the first topic because every we are used at YMC to uh, deploy everything as Debian packages. Um, I um, built Debian packages of Hadoop. Ja you know, of course, what Debian is, but uh, do you hear me? Um, it's Debian is the most often used, uh, or one of the most often used server operation systems. So it's very likely that your Hadoop cluster ends up to be deployed on top of Debian. So it may be may make sense um, to have it as Debian packages. Um, well, it is Linux mostly, if it's not FreeBSD or uh, um, the other thing. Um, who of you uh, still uses Windows to develop? Is there anybody? Don't feel ashamed. I'm only interested. Wow, still that much. Uh, <laughs> and for deployment to uh, as a server operation system? Still, okay, because I wonder why Hadoop still supports Windows, okay. Um, well, Debian runs on everything from your coffee machine uh, and on in the top 500 server list of the biggest clusters and Deb Debian is not only an operation system but also uh, an accumulation of best practices of many server administrators um, so why should you use the Debian packages instead of um, downloading the tarball from the Apache project or using maybe the Cloudera distribution or the Yahoo distribution, or whatever is out there, or your own one. Um, well, it's easier for you to get it installed, and it's what's more important, it's easier for your colleagues. If you, you may be familiar to download the tarball and um, get your Hadoop cluster um, running on your development machine and on your test cluster, but, but if you have a team of uh, five developers and you want, and you tell them, install Hadoop on your dev machine to um, test something out. Um, he n um, it's easier for him to just up get install Hadoop and he's done. Well, um, it's I'm not sure if you care, but as in De Debian, everything what's in the main distribution of Debian is free software and every file has been reviewed. So you don't won't run into any license issues if you um, install Hadoop on a client's cluster. Um, well, um, and if you're the developer, but somebody else administrates your cluster where you want to install Hadoop on, system administrators normally don't like tarballs. They don't want to install some random tarballs, download it from some random page, page and three weeks later you can come with another tarball and want this one installed, they want packages to, so that they know what is installed on the system. Um, the Debian package gives you the dependency management and it takes care of um, all the details so that um, the configuration is in the right place where it belongs. Um, that um, changing data is beneath of var, that logs are stored in var log, and that um, um, daemon pit files are stored in var run, where it belongs and where it cl gets cleaned up when you restart the server. It sets uh, the R limits so that you don't run into uh, too many open files issues normally or gives uh, same defaults for the heap size. What's packaged right now, it's uh, Zookeeper, Hadoop, Harbase. Zola is packaged for longer, but it fits in this list. And what's the status? Ah, about Java and packaging. Um, Java 
only recently became open source. So um, Linux distributions and Java didn't met for a long time that much. So there are still many issues to work out. Java people um, don't know how they should provide um, their project so that it can be easily packaged. They even don't care if it's packaged. And uh, Linux people or uh, distribution people don't still have issues um, to package uh, Java projects the right way. Um, so some issues if you're up an upstream um, man we have issues with if you provide binary or any compiled files in your tarballs because we at Debian needs to make sure that um, everything we uh, distribute can be rebuilt um, from the source we provide. So we throw away every binary, every um, Java jar file and rebuild them to make sure that um, we have the source for everything and that it can be rebuilt. Um, sometimes there are even aren't tarballs, but only um, source jars in some distant Maven repository that's linked deep in the page. Um, I still find CVS repositories beneath uh, Java Pro. Uh, Java.net is a nightmare if anybody knows this. Um, well, and inflexible build systems. When I build, when I rebuild the packages, I need to um, give another class path because all Java jars on Debian are saved in user shared Java normally, and uh, it's expected somebody else. Or I want to exclude some contributions to not be packaged or some parts of the code because um, I don't have the dependencies. Two minutes. Oh shit. Okay, that's this one. Um, but I have another 15 for the Zookeeper stuff. Okay, um, just three additional slides um, because Um, just to let you know, there is a project running right now, HBazine. Um, it's inspired by the project Lusandra, where somebody um, posted in March about his experience um, storing a Lucene index on top of the Cassandra database. And it, he already wrote, well, it could be done with um, HBase or so. So um, I did it, and another one from New York did it in parallel, and now we combined our efforts. Um, oh, that's it. So shit. <laughs> well, um, you find it under the name HBazine, and it's still very early, but if you're interested in storing a Lucene index on top of HBazine, it is possible, we are working on it, we need your help, and it's very interesting. So, questions about Debian or HBazine? Right, this is a very shallow talk of my own. Oh. One moment. Hands up who lives in a city. Hands up who knows how it works. Wow. Because one of the weird things is that when you look in a city, people move around all the time. Nobody has a clue where they're coming from, where they're going to, or why. Every so often, the local council go and measure it by sending somebody to sit with a car at a junction and press click on a counter. And that's really stupid, because machines can do that a lot more efficiently. You could leave a laptop in your house running for, say, a year, and you'd collect data on how they use it. I'd know that somebody goes past my front door at 10 to 9 every morning. If I build a large graph of it, I could actually show in the blue how people commute past my house walking on a weekday and how it's different from a weekend. If you really have time, you could actually write more interesting algorithms here. Like you could say, let's group them into people that live there, people who are commuters, people who are students. You could identify people who would travel with each other and their friends, or even actually when they're not friends anymore. That's the thing I pointed out. 
You can predict where peak flow is going to be. You can actually test when you make changes to a road design whether it's worked or not. And finally, you can just try and understand why people move around a city, which is effectively the core to how a city works. So, key point to take home. The total information on how people move around a city, that data on who, who we are and how we get around, is a profound piece of data. If you're building a shop, if you're a, a town planner, it's just a profound data to have. And you know we can collect it finally without going there pressing the click button. But the people who are collecting it, you out there with your iPhones and other GPS-enabled devices are giving it away for next to nothing. You're giving it to Foursquare, you're giving it to Facebook, who then share it with anybody at all. And sometimes people do collect it legitimately, like we've got a nice experiment going on in Bath, and people go, oh, they're collecting our Bluetooth data, it's a terrible thing, and it's not, it's really interesting. So, four questions to take home. One, are we the people who are collecting data and pushing up to the big servers, giving it away for next to nothing? We do that for supermarket loyalty cards, maybe that's not wrong, but who owns that aggregate data? Once you've got all the data on where people move around the city, who, who hangs on to that? Especially my data, who owns the history of where I've moved around the city? If Twitter's logging where I am when I post something and they give that away to the library, then you know that my data is being made public, my history of movements is being made public. And finally, for the programmers in the group, what can we do with all this really interesting data we're collecting? Questions? <coughs> you in the corner. <laughs> um, right, you can have my data from my street if you want. The bath stuff, I have some of that data, but not all of it. I'm trying to, I've got a 40 machine cluster, virtual cluster, that I'm trying to get the master's student to do some analysis on, but the people at Bath University won't share the data with me. Oh, Thomas? Um, couldn't there be an iPhone app to collect the data? And so you are also sending the data, but also collect, collecting the data, and you could <coughs> make people aware uh, with this iPhone app, well, I collect all the data from the people around me, and so am I collected. You could do that, but that's what Foursquare does, and people are happy to know which pub their friends are at. Yeah. There's some weird stuff in the new Apple license about location data where Apple say you can do stuff in the background, you have to disclose it. Apple say we will do the analysis in our data center so they get to find out where everybody goes. And then, but the point is if, I get, if, you, if your web browser goes to say Google Street View and pulls down a street, that you're telling the server there where you are and if you pull down the street next door 20 seconds later, you just told them where you've moved and how long it took you to get there, which is a really interesting bit of the data set as well. And now I will hand you over to our next speaker, who is called Thomas. <laughs> Let's find the mouse. Uh, well, I just gave a talk on a bar camp the day before about Hadoop and Zookeeper, and we'll give it again on Linux tech. And I thought because I heard a uh, that I sh saw that there is no Zookeeper talk here, just to give a short introduction to Zookeeper, because uh, after um, playing around with Hadoop, HBase, and Zookeeper, I finally realized that although Hadoop and HBase gets gets the more bass, Zookeeper, af um, s after my opinion, is the cooler project and more interesting. So, just get around all the Hadoop stuff. Well, Zookeeper, it's a file system of uh, Z nodes. Um, Z nodes are um, um, as well files as they are folders. You can store data inside of Z nodes. Uh, da the data sh may not be um, bigger than one megabyte, and you can store other other Z nodes under Z node, so that they are like folders, and you can put watches on that node so that you are notified if the data inside of that node changes, if the account of children or beneath the, the Z node changes, or if the Z node itself gets deleted. Um, all operations on that nodes are atomic, 
so um, there are, is no half written data or half read data and well there is a kind of optimistic locking every um, operation that changes data um, inside on zookeeper can get an optional version number s so that you tell zookeeper well the last time i saw the that note it had that version number please uh, modify it change it but only if it still has this version number so that you're sure that nothing um, changed it in between well why another uh, file system we have hdfs which is distributed and hopefully soon highly available um, HDFS is optimized for other use cases, for streaming, for big data. Zookeeper is optimized for random access and for small pieces of data, um, for, um, for a short latency, and um, it has some gimmicks on top of it. It has um, watches, locking, and guaranteed um, sequence. Well, why do you need Zookeeper? Because um, alg algorithm and distributed algorithms um, are some of the most complicated topics in computer science and um, you're glad if somebody already solved many of the problems involved with them and this is what Zookeeper provides you. Many uh, the, a foundation on top of which you can build a more abstract algorithms. Um, it um, helps you to solve race conditions, it helps you to solve deadlocks and okay that's specific to something else. Architecture. You have um, a quorum of zookeeper servers. Every zookeeper is equal but one is more equal. Um, one is elected to be the zookeeper leader, but everybody could become the leader. It's guaranteed that at every time there's only one leader and this leader is necessary to um, orchestrate the zookeeper cluster. Um, the clients can connect to any zookeeper server um, that since they are all equal and they don't need to know who's the leader Zookeeper API. Um, well, you create a Z node, uh, you can get, give it access control things, and you set some flags on the Z node. Flags are if the Z node is um, ephemeral. Ephemeral means um, if the client goes down and um, after a t defined time out, the Z node vanishes. And you can use this um, to um, for um, doing your logs as long as a client is online or for leader election to now when a leader um, of your service goes down and somebody else needs to take over. Um, you, you delete and as I said, you need to give the expected version, set data, the data inside the Z node, get the data inside the Z node. Well, and you provide when you get data from Zookeeper, you can optionally provide um, a watcher. A watcher is a callback that gets notified um, when the data you got changes. So as long as your callback hasn't been called, you can be sure that the data is still um, current. Um, guarantees from Zookeeper. Uh, sequential consistency, uh, Another client sees the changes in the zookeeper cluster in exact in exact the same sequence as I've um, done them on in my client. Everything is atomic, as I told you. Um, it's guaranteed that there is only one single view of the zookeeper file system at any time at any client. Well, it's reliable um, as long as. Um, most of the zookeeper servers are still running, the zookeeper cluster is running. Well, and I don't understand the last guarantee, the timeliness um, right, I think. And what um, I like 
um, I have added this to the list. The others are from the homepage. Um, you can be sure that there are no zombies. Um, that if you connect to a zookeeper server, he is e either connected to the Chrome and is online and is working, or he will reject the connection and won't give you any false outdated data. Well, algorithms you can do on top of Zookeeper are um, distributed locking um, a barrier so that you can wait for n number of servers to enter a barrier uh, or for n number of servers um, to leave it before something happens. Um, you can easily um, implement a producer-consumer queue on top of Zookeeper or you can uh, use it for leader election if you have um, a monitoring system and you only need one uh, server to run this monitoring system but there should be one so um, the server running the monitor system puts a lock um, in Zookeeper if he goes down the lock disappears and another ca one can take over well some um, applications, mainly for web developers, you could store a PHP session in Zookeeper, a shopping cart, config data. That's it. And the demo would be just up get install Zookeeper and have fun. Quest questions? No, there is no timer mechanism. I mentioned it because um, in another project we had five, six, seven cron jobs and every cron job had its own method um, to lock so that it won't be overrun by a following cron job. And that's uh, some use case for Zookeeper. Um, for a produce your consumer code to load RSS atom feed so that only one server is loading a feed at a time and if the server should go down while the feed is loaded and the locking Z node disappears and another server can load this particular feed. But you can use this for any workload that n needs to be done but only by w one server. Thanks. How fast is it? Like how many I don't know numbers, but uh, you can look them up because um, Yahoo is the power user of Zookeeper and um, the main um, contributor to Zookeeper. The project started at Yahoo and they have published some um, benchmarks on really big clusters. Thanks again. All right, well, I'd like to thank everyone for turning up and speaking. And now I believe it is time for beer. That's a German word, is that right? Yeah. Okay, wir trinken. <laughs>